Hi everyone, my name is Mark Quinn. I'm a tax advisor and chartered financial planner based in Portugal and I help clients relocate here and manage their tax and financial affairs accordingly. In this video I'm going to look at the general Portuguese tax system and we're going to cover everything from um, tax residency to property tax and more. As I've mentioned before, none of the videos I make are designed to replace an individual consultation with a qualified advisor, um, so please make sure you're reviewing your specific situation with a professional. So the first and most obvious question for somebody looking to relocate to Portugal is where do I pay tax? Well that's really dependent on where you're tax resident and we'll, we'll cover this more in question two of the guide which will focus more on the issue of tax residency. But as a general rule, if you're a tax resident in one country, you're going to pay tax on your worldwide in income and gains. So if we look at uh, Portugal, if you're a tax resident here, you have to declare all your income and your gains, irrespective of whether they're taxed or not. So that's a general obligation for a tax resident. If you're not a tax resident here in Portugal, then you only have to declare and pay tax on Portuguese source income. And the most typical example for most of our clients would be uh, rental income from, from properties they own here. One of the common mistakes we hear a lot is that people believe they can choose where they, they pay tax. So they believe it, you know, if they have assets and um, income in the UK and Portugal, they have the ability to choose which jurisdiction they pay tax in. And that isn't actually true. As a, as I say, it comes back to where you're tax resident. If you're tax resident in Portugal, you pay tax here and vice versa for the UK as a broad rule. Now, this relates to another issue as to, you know, some people will say, well, in that case, am I going to pay tax twice? You know, am I going to pay tax in the UK and in Portugal? And the answer to that question is, is yes and no. So Portugal and the UK have a double taxation treaty and that prevents you from paying tax twice. And it, it also um, provides a series of rules for determining which country has a taxing right over you. Also, it's unaffected by Brexit. So the UK-Portugal Double Taxation Treaty actually predates the existence of the EU. So it's dated 1968 or 69, I can never remember which, but a long time before the formation of the EU. And so the, uh, the tax position for UK nationals moving to Portugal is, is the same it isn't affected in any way by Brexit. Also under the treaty, um, it is possible to be tax residents in theory in two countries. So we'll, again, we'll cover this on question two, but as a, as a broad concept, a lot of countries have a 182 day rule. So if you're, if you're in the country for more than 182 days, you can be considered a tax resident in that country. And, and Portugal has, um, has that as one of its definitions of tax residency. But if you think about the UK, the UK um, has a system which is a lot more complicated and, and means that you can be considered a tax resident by spending as little as 16 days back in the UK. So if you spent, for example, 17 days back in the UK, more than six months in Portugal, you could be considered a tax resident in theory under both countries' tax rules. Now, again, this is where the Double Taxation Treaty saves you because the treaty considers uh, a series of, of steps that you can look through. It's called the, the tiebreaker clauses, whereby one country will win the taxing right over you. So again, you never, you're not going to pay tax twice. You'll simply end up paying tax in the, in the, in the jurisdiction which has the highest tax rate. Another point to note on the DT Treaty is that it doesn't cover inheritance tax. Now, inheritance tax from a Portuguese standpoint is quite simple because there is none. It was abolished in 2003. But if you're a UK domicile, which broadly means if you originate from the UK, then you're, going, you're still going to have a UK inheritance tax liability, even if you leave the UK and never return, uh, return to the UK shores. Now, that is a complicated area. Um, I am going to do a, a more detailed video on that at some point in the future. Uh, but you really do need to take individual advice on inheritance tax, especially in light of the fact, as I say, there's no double taxation treaty covering IHT issues. So how do you know if you're a Portuguese tax resident? 
Well, as I said on the question one, the, the general rule for many countries, and Portugal um, includes this definition of tax residency, is if you're here more than 182 days of the year, then you can be considered a tax resident. Now, uh, to get more specific, the Portuguese tax rule is actually uh, exceeding 182 days in any rolling 12 month period. So it's not actually a calendar year um, assessment that you're making, it's, it's every 12 month period you, you have to look back over. So this will come up throughout the video uh, when I say you've got to take record keeping seriously. So make sure you're tracking your days in and out of different countries that you're, you're spending time in in order that if you ever are challenged, you've got the evidence to, to show where you were. The other definition of tax residency in Portugal is even if you don't necessarily meet the 182 day criterion, you can be considered a tax resident here if your main home is here. So if your main or permanent residence is here, um, you could be considered a tax resident here, even if you're spending fewer than, than six months in the country. Generally, you're considered a tax resident from the the first day of arrival in Portugal. And Portugal allows by default what we call split year treatment, which is a contrast to the UK. So a split year means that you can be considered a tax resident from day one, even if you haven't acquired sufficient time in the country. And that's automatic under Portuguese tax rules. The UK is a bit more complicated. You can use split year treatment from a UK perspective, but there are um, specific rules on when you're allowed to use that, that split year basis. So if you're arriving in Portugal as a tax resident here, how do you know if you're still a tax resident elsewhere under their rules? Now, most of our clients are coming from a UK uh, background, so we'll focus on that in this video. And the UK has particularly challenging rules on tax residency. It's not as simple as the Portuguese tax system. And it means that even if you've left the UK, you can still be dragged back into the UK tax net unless you cap your time back in the UK to a certain number of days. And, and that number of days isn't, uh, it's not one figure. So many people come to us believing it's a 90 day rule. So as long as you're not in the UK more than 90 days, you can't be considered a tax resident there. In fact, it can be uh, far fewer than 90 days. As I said previously in this video, it can be as little as 16 days. Um, it can be 16, 45, 90, 120 or 192 days. And how it works is that it's based on your families and your individual position. There's no set rule for each person. It's related to how many ties and connections you have to the UK. And this is all governed in a piece of legislation called the Statutory Residence Test 2013. It's quite complicated. I think it's about 60 pages of legislation, over 100 pages of HMRC guidance notes. Um, and it's so detailed that it's out with the, you know, the, the scope of this video. But we do guide individuals through this, um, this residency test, making sure you have a clear understanding of you know, where your liabilities belong and how to escape the UK tax net. So if you do want an individual review of your position, just let us know. If you have links to other countries, so for example, Spain and France, they have the concept of um, economic and financial interest, which can tie you back into tax, tax residency in those two countries. And Spain also has um, a clause whereby even if your family are there, you, you could still be considered a tax resident there even if you're not spending a lot of time there, by the fact that your family and or your main um, business interests, for example, are there. So it's very nuanced. Um, and as I say, make sure you take individual advice. So when and how do you complete a Portuguese tax return? Well, the tax year in, in Portugal is or runs from January to December. And the tax return is filed in generally in the spring the following year. So for this year, 2024, you would file a tax return spring 2025 and the, the tax uh, liability is paid in generally July. All residents of Portugal, including non-habitual residents, which we'll cover in the next question, are obligated to complete a tax return 
irrespective of whether your um, your income and your gains actually um, cause a tax issue. So even if you don't have any tax to pay, you still have to submit a, a, a tax return. If you're a non-resident, on the other hand, you only have to declare your Portuguese source income, for example, rental income occurring from properties based inside of Portugal. Portugal also allows you to submit joint tax returns. So if you're married, or even if you've been living together as unmarried couples for, I believe it's more than two years, you can form um, a joint tax return together. And that can be advantageous because you can use each other's allowances. So for example, if one partner doesn't have any income or has income lower than the other partner, it could be advantageous to submit it on a joint basis. But equally, you can choose to elect a single tax return basis if you prefer. Something we're asked a lot is, you know, how will tax authorities know where my income and gains coming from? Well, tax authorities are becoming uh, very smart and also much more interconnected than they were in the past. And part of this is a result of the um, OECD's common reporting standard. And this allows for an automatic sharing of information between financial institutions and tax authorities and the sharing of tax authorities information cross border. So for example, if you had interest arising from a UK bank account and you're a tax resident in Portugal, the bank would automatically uh, declare or report rather the income that's generated from your account to HMRC in the UK. HMRC in turn will send that information to the Portuguese tax authorities and so if there's any mismatch between what you declare um, on your Portuguese tax return and what they've received automatically in the sharing of information from the UK, it does flag up uh, a mismatch. So, you know, it, it's, it's uh, something that needs to be handled very carefully and accurately. What is non-habitual residency and can you apply? Well, I've covered this in many videos before. Non-habitual residency is a 10-year tax incentivized scheme for new residents of, of Portugal. As long as you haven't been a tax resident here in the last five years, you're, you're, that you qualify under the main condition. And it does allow you a period of 10 years to plan your affairs, to, to structure yourself, that you're going to be paying little or no tax here. The main benefits of NHR are um, tax-free foreign source income and gains as a general rule, the ability to take pension income and flat rate of uh, 10%, and also um, qualify for high valued activities on any employment and self-employment income. So you're only paying a flat 20% uh, rate of tax compared to you know, the standard tax bands which go as high as 48% here. So quite an attractive uh, regime if you can qualify for it. As I've also said in other videos, 2024 is a transitional year because uh, in October, 2023, the government actually announced the closure of the NHR regime. Now, um, as a concession, it did grant some exceptions so that certain individuals can still qualify uh, during 2024 for membership of the NHR regime. Um, I've done a separate video on this, so just look through my channel for, for details of that. Uh, but at the same time, the government also introduced another version of the non-habitual residence regime. It doesn't really have a name as such yet, so we're calling it NHR 2.0 for, for simplicity. But that could also offer you the ability to, again, create a 10-year window where you're structured effectively. It is very nuanced, um, so it does require individual advice and analysis of your, your specific situation and how the, the, the two regimes would apply. Um, if you don't qualify for either of those regimes, you can still live here tax efficiently. I mean, it very much depends on how you're gener generating your income and gains, but Portugal can still be a fantastic place to live. And uh, I'll cover the, the standard Portuguese tax rates a bit later on in this guide. So if you don't qualify for any special tax incentive regime, what are the standard rates, that, uh, rates of tax that you're going to be paying? Well, as a general rule, most income falls into the progressive tax bands that you're probably familiar with from a UK context. So in other words, 
the higher your income is, um, the more tax you pay. So if you sit into this band, you'll pay a lower rate of tax than if you sit into the higher tax, tax bands. So it's a progressive tax system. Um, I'll put a table below in the description so you can see the income tax bands at different levels. Um, if we're thinking about interest and dividends, it's generally quite simple. It's a flat 28% tax, uh, unless it's coming from blacklisted jurisdictions, in which case it could be 35% tax. So the main blacklisted jurisdictions you'll know from a UK context are uh, the Channel Islands, so Jersey, Guernsey, um, and also um, Isle of Man and Gibraltar. They're the key blacklisted jurisdictions that we see uh, most clients coming from the UK have, have exposure to. There is also a standard um, zero rate threshold of €4,104 Euros that each person can use. Uh, but it can only be used to offset against employment and pension income. So if you add interest or dividends, it can't be used to offset against those two, those, those two income sources. So if you're working in Portugal, where do you pay tax and social security? This is one of the most confusing areas of, um, of tax and social security because what we see a lot of is people may be working here, but they might be working for a UK company with, for example, US clients, and it all gets a bit confusing in, in the minds of, of most people. But really, it's quite simple because, again, coming back to the Double Taxation Treaty, the treaty guides you as to where you should be paying tax. So for, employee, for employees, the rule is that you pay tax in the jurisdiction you perform the work. So let's take an example. If you're uh, working as um, a salesperson or whatever for a UK company, but your, uh, your duties are performed um, behind a Portuguese desk all year, then it doesn't matter that where the employer is based, that they're in the UK, or in fact that you could be paid in sterling to the UK bank account. Because you're a tax resident here in Portugal, and because the work is performed in Portugal, then um, your obligation is to pay tax to the Portuguese tax authorities and social security. If, however, you are employed, but you perform some of the work in the UK, so for example, you, you perform three months of the work in the UK on UK soil and the remaining nine months here in Portugal, then the position is that you'd pay tax on nine twelfths of the income in Portugal because that was the work performed on Portuguese soil and conversely three months uh, or three twelfths of your annual income will be taxed in the UK. So how it works from a PAYE perspective is that because you're not working in the UK anymore uh, your employer should pay you gross so they shouldn't be deducting any tax at source and your um, as I say, your obligation, 100% of your earnings is reportable and taxed in, in Portugal. Self-employed people have a slightly different basis for tax. So unlike employees whereby they pay tax in the jurisdiction perform their, uh, in the jurisdiction they perform their work, for self-employed people, the double taxation treaty says that you pay tax in the country that you're tax resident. So if you're a tax resident in Portugal, your, um, your tax and social security liabilities belong to Portugal solely. For self-employed people, we, they also have the ability to actually report their income on two different bases. One is the conventional method that you'll probably be used to in the UK. So you prepare a set of accounts as a self-employed person, you look at your gross profit, deduct your expenses and pay tax on your net profit. And you can do that in Portugal too. But there's also what's called a simplified reporting regime, which as the name says, makes things a lot simpler because you don't actually have to prepare um, annual accounts. What you're doing is you're submitting a, a return and the government sets out set percentages that you may declare depending on your, your type of, of role. And these are called coefficients. So the standard um, starting point is that uh, as a, a self-employed person, you're deemed to have 25% of your income as expenses. So if you're, you earn 100,000, you're actually declaring 75,000. 
and 25,000 is deemed to be expenses. But that's a standard self-employed um, coefficient, but there are others as low as 15%. So in that case, 85% of your income would be deemed to be your, your expenses and only 15% actually taxable. So it can work out in, uh, you know, very tax efficiently, but it really depends on the type of role you do and it needs to be analysed by an accountant. Social security aspect you also have to consider. Again, it's similar to how it works in the UK. So if you're employed, you have a, a, a liability to pay social security again to the, the Portuguese tax authorities uh, and your employer also has a duty to pay Portuguese social security contributions and for self-employed people again standard um, standard basis similar to what you already uh, know from, from the UK context. It's also worth highlighting that if you're a director of a company uh, and you're running the company but you're doing it from a Portuguese uh, desk you need to be careful about what we call exporting the company. So even though you may be working or running, uh, running a UK company, if the direction and the control of the company is done from Portuguese soil, it, uh, it could actually be seen from a tax point of view that the UK company um, is actually a Portuguese company from a tax point of view. Because from, from a corporation tax point of view, a company is based where it's directed and controlled from. So just be careful you don't fall into any holes in that respect. How is bank interest tax? Well, as I said before, uh, interest, very simple, 28% uh, flat rate of tax, unless it's coming from a blacklisted jurisdiction, in which case it's 35% tax. For non-habitual residents, subject to the, the double taxation treaty where the account is in Portugal, but as a general rule, it would be tax-free here as long as it's tax, either taxed or taxable in the source country. But interest arising on Portuguese source bank accounts, even if you're a non-habitual resident, you're going to pay the, the same 28% flat rate of tax. How is your pension tax in Portugal? Well, this is quite a confusing area because there's somewhat of a mismatch between what we from a UK context would regard as a pension and what the Portuguese government uh, considers a pension scheme. So you have to be quite careful around pension planning in particular and the, the tax rates that you're likely to, to face. If you're a non-habitual resident, it's very simple because for those 10 years you've got the 10% flat rate. Or if you applied pre-April 2020, it's actually a 0% tax rate. But if you're a standard rate Portuguese tax resident, then the default position that um, private pension schemes, state pension schemes, etc., they're always taxed in Portugal rather than the UK or wherever the pension is based. That's the, the general rule. And the default position that they're, is that they're taxed at the scale rate. So as we discussed earlier, the standard income tax bans, the higher the pension, uh, pension income is, the higher the tax rate you'll face. The only exception to that general rule is on UK civil service schemes. Again, referencing back to the Double Taxation Treaty, that tells us that if your income derives from a formal civil service scheme, like police, certain NHS workers, teachers, etc., that pension income only um, is taxable only in the UK and not taxable in Portugal. So you'll declare it in Portugal, but you won't pay tax here. You'll pay tax in the UK only. And you'll also have your basic personal allowance, which is just over £12,500 in the UK to offset against the, the income that is arising from former civil service schemes. The state pension, again, is taxed in Portugal, uh, not in the UK. There is an option on private pension schemes as well so that you don't actually have to pay in tax in the UK. So, as I said, the, the double taxation treaty gives a taxing right to Portugal only, so the UK doesn't have the taxing right on private pension scheme income. However, unless the pension scheme know that you're not a tax resident in the UK anymore, they will deduct tax at source. Uh, and withhold that until you can demonstrate that you're actually, actually a tax resident here. And there's a specific process that you have, have to go through in order to do that, and that's by 
by completing what's called the DT individual form. It's an HMRC form, uh, DT means double taxation, um, and you complete that here in Portugal, get the, um, the, the tax residency certificate from the Portuguese tax authorities to show HMRC that you're, you're now a, a tax resident here rather than there. You return that to HMRC and then HMRC will liaise with your pension provider to, to tell them that you're not a UK tax resident anymore and that you can uh, they, they can release the funds to you gross of tax rather than deducting tax at source. But you do have to take a small amount of income in order to trigger that, that process. So not, not only do you have to complete the DT individual process, but you also have to trigger a small income payment in order for that process to be reconciled. Taking your tax-free cash from your pension scheme, again, this is an area that causes some confusion with clients because from a UK context, we know that we can, we're able to take 25% of our pension fund as a tax-free lump sum. It's now called the pension commencement lump sum. However, that's a, a tax incentive that the UK government gives to UK tax residents. Now, if you're no longer a UK tax resident, you're not able to take advantage of that concession, unfortunately. So if you take the income or take the tax-free cash rather whilst you're on Portuguese soil and you're a Portuguese tax resident, you're going to pay tax on that. So that comes back to making sure you have a, a, a roadmap and a series of dates and times in mind where you're doing different things along the journey, making sure you're taking the tax-free cash as a general planning point before you leave the UK and then income only when you're here in Portugal. However, I stress that that's a general planning point because that's kind of been, um, that type of planning has been upended by the uh, abolition of the NHR regime because under NHR, you generally take the tax-free cash before you left the UK and take the income when you arrive in Portugal because you'd have a lower income tax rate on your pension income. Now that needs a much more careful analysis because the income uh, tax in the UK may be more advantageous to, to utilise prior to departure. Um, so again, it, it always comes back to making sure you have an individual analysis of your situation. How is investment income taxed? Well, the most common sources of investment income we see our clients have are dividends from unit trusts or uh, directly held shares or investment trusts. Uh, this is quite simple, it's a flat 28% tax rate unless those dividends again arise from a, a blacklisted jurisdiction in which case they're 35%. <clears throat> now this applies, that, that treatment applies even if they're held within ISAs because individual savings accounts are a, a tax incentive for UK tax residents. If you're no longer a UK tax resident and you're now a tax re resident here in Portugal you're going to face tax on any dividends arising from ISA, ISA portfolios. Um, so if the ISAs are in the UK, it's going to be 28% on interest and dividends generated by those ISAs. You can continue to hold ISAs as a, as a non-UK tax resident if the ISA company will allow you to, uh, but you can't add to them. So you don't necessarily have to close them down. Uh, but you can't add any further funds to the ICE portfolio. And because they're going to be taxed going forward, uh, they, they lose the tax efficiency. It is worth reviewing your options for the ICEs or the proceeds if you choose to, to wind them down. Another common structure we see is investment bond structures. Um, these are commonly used in the UK and they're, they're quite tax efficient here in Portugal too. In fact, the Portuguese tax authority gives you tax reductions over time. So the longer you hold these structures, the lower your tax rate is going to, um, going to reduce to. Uh, it is worth reviewing where you hold these bonds though, because um, from a UK context, often the bonds are set up in blacklisted jurisdictions, which means the tax rate is less favorable than onshore whitelisted jurisdictions. Um, and also if the bond is held onshore from a UK context, there is a 20% deemed tax rate that um, the insurance fund pays. Now if that's moved to an offshore fund, you can avoid that internal life insurance company fund taxation. So again, reviewing options is key uh, prior to departure from the UK. If you want to sell some of your investments, what tax rate are you going to pay? 
Well, the standard capital gains tax rate in Portugal is 28%. The only exception to that is if you've held the um, investment that you're selling less than 365 days, in which case it, the gain gets added to your income for the year, assuming your income exceeds a set threshold. So, um, in other words, your tax rate goes from 28% up to as high as 48% if you're short-term trading. If you're in the fortunate position that you've acquired any assets or investments prior to the 1st of January 1989, these are completely tax-free. Um, any pre-89 assets can't be taxed at all, nor can crypto assets, again, as long as you've held them longer than 365 days. Linking back to the other points, we discussed ISAs. Again, gains on ISA portfolios realised whilst you're in the UK as a UK tax resident are free of tax because the ISA shell protects them from tax. If you're selling ISA investments as a Portuguese tax resident, they, they, they've lost their tax protection of the ISA and the gains are fully taxed at either 28% or added to your income and uh, the, the appropriate tax plan you fall into. If you have a trust, the tax treatment is quite simple. Any income deriving from a trust is taxed at a flat 28% unless it derives from a blacklisted jurisdiction, in which case it's 35%. There are ways of getting out of trust that um, you know, at low tax rates are even completely free of tax. So if you are holding investments in a trust shell that you need to access you know, income and gains from, it may be um, a good time to review that option prior to establishing Portuguese tax residency. Or even if you're here already, there are still options available for you to, to, um, to significantly reduce your, your tax rates on the trust income. How is rental income tax? Well, it's quite simple. It's either taxed at a flat rate of 28% income tax rate, or it can be added to your other income and the progressive tax rates apply if that's beneficial to you. If it's an overseas property, again, we need to uh, look at the double taxation treaty. As a general rule, what happens is the, the Double Taxation Treaty generally gives the taxing right to the country the property is located. So if you have a UK property, for example, you'll always pay tax on the rental income in the UK. However, as you're a, a Portuguese tax resident, going back to what we said at the, the very start of this video, you have a duty to pay tax and report all your worldwide in, income and gains in Portugal. So you'd pay tax here on the rental income, but you would get the credit for any tax paid in the UK. So you wouldn't pay tax twice, but you just pay the tax at the highest rate, whichever that is, either UK or Portugal. For non-habitual residents, you wouldn't pay any tax in Portugal if the country in which the property is located levies tax on the rental income. So a classic example is the UK. The UK does tax the, the rental income, Therefore, Portugal are happy under the NHR regime and therefore allow you to earn the, the income here tax-free, even though, again, it still is reportable on your annual tax declaration. If you want to sell a Portuguese property, what tax rate will you pay? Well, as we discussed earlier, if it's a pre-1st of January 1989 acquisition, there's no capital gains tax, so you don't have to worry. For all other cases, how it works in Portugal is that you pay tax on 50% of the gain and that's added to your income tax balance to determine what tax rate you fall into. Now there are two main exemptions in Portugal. So unlike the UK where we can sell our main residence free of tax, in Portugal, whether it's a, an investment property or your main residence, you always pay capital gains tax on the gain. The two reliefs, however, are if you're selling your main residence here and reinvesting in another property, either in Portugal or anywhere else in the EU, you don't have the capital gains tax issue. Or something that was recently introduced in 2019, I believe, uh, was an investment option or an investment or pension fund option. So if you have a, a gain on your main residence, but you don't necessarily want to buy another property, or you want to downsize, you can reinvest the proceeds or the, uh, the difference into an approved pensions or investment structure. It has the same effect of reinvesting in another EU property, so again, you completely eliminate your, your capital gains tax issue. 
please note that the NHR status doesn't benefit you in any way on the, the sale of Portuguese property because you're just treated as a standard Portuguese tax resident. So if you're downsizing, as we, we discussed in the last question, there are reliefs available. Um, you can use an approved pension stroke investment structure. There are conditions to be eligible for the capital gains tax relief. And the key ones are that you either have to be 65 uh, years of age or retired. Um, you need to reinvest in the structure within six months of the sale of the property. Uh, the structure has to allow for an income of up to 7.5% each year. And the property that you sell uh, has to have been your main home. It can't have been a, uh, an investment property. So we've discussed the position on selling a Portuguese property. What happens if you want to sell a UK property? So as we said before, the taxing right on property generally belongs to the country the property is situated in. So in the case of a UK property, UK has the first taxing right. If you're selling the property, you're going to pay capital gains tax in the UK. However, there was a concession introduced in 2015, such that if you're selling it as a non-UK tax resident, you only pay tax on any gains that have accrued since the 6th of April 2015. So if you bought the property in 2000 and saw substantial growth between 2000 and 2015, all that growth is ignored. You just reset your acquisition cost effectively as at the 6th of April 2015 and pay tax on that, that gain since, since 2015. You do still have your annual capital gains tax allowances in the UK to offset against uh, the gains. However, from 6th of April 2024, this is just £3,000 each compared to over £12,000 um, a few years ago. So it has substantially reduced. In addition to the UK tax issues, you also have to think about Again, if you're a tax resident here, you have to declare your worldwide income and gains in Portugal. Therefore, you still have to declare the gain in, Port in Portugal, whether it's taxed or not. Now, if you're a non-habitual resident, it will be tax-free. Going back to the principle that if it's taxed somewhere else, it's tax-free here under the NHR regime. If you don't qualify for NHR, you're going to pay tax on 50% of the gain at your scale rates in Portugal. So how can you save tax efficiently in Portugal? We've said that the standard rates of tax on investment uh, interest and dividends aren't uh, very attractive, and you also have capital gains tax on an ongoing basis. We've also talked about how ISAs are, you know, lose their tax efficiency once you establish tax residency in Portugal. Well, the good news, are, good news is that there still are um, tax efficient alternatives in Portugal that actually work in a similar way to ISAs. So they allow you to enjoy gross roll up so there's no income tax or capital gains tax on a rising basis, full flexibility in terms of what you can put into the, the, the wrapper, uh, very tax efficient as a Portuguese tax resident, but also if you do return to the UK in future, you can take these types of investments back with you. They don't have to be unwound unlike ISAs or in some cases pension schemes which do have to be closed down when you move. So they're very tax effective, very cost effective um, and we can discuss those, those options with you on a one-to-one -one basis because they have to be tailored to your specific needs and, and family's position. What happens if you die as a Portuguese tax resident? Well as I said before, Portugal is simple from an inheritance tax perspective, i.e. there is none. It was abolished in 2003. There is a form of what's called stamp duty at a rate of 10%, but this doesn't apply if you're leaving assets to your direct line descendants, direct line ascendants, or to your spouse. It also doesn't apply if you're leaving non-Portuguese assets. So it's a territorial tax applying to Portuguese source assets only. So what tax do you pay on gifts? So linking back to the previous question, what happens if you want to make a lifetime gift? Well, in the same principle as on, as on death, there's no tax when you're making gifts to direct line descendants or ascendants or between spouses. Um, in all other cases, it's a flat 10% rate of tax and that's the stamp duty tax rate. What about bringing capital into Portugal? So some clients ask me, are there going to be any entry taxes when I bring my capital in? 
And Portugal, again, is quite simple in this respect because there's no entry um, tax on bringing money into the country. Portugal is mainly only interested in any income or gains arising. If you want to bring a capital sum in from wherever it may be, there's no tax issues coming into Portugal. If you leave Portugal in the future, are there going to be any tax issues associated with your departure? Well, again, good news, there's no exit tax from a Portuguese standpoint. The only issue is, and it very rarely applies to, to our clients that are coming from the UK, but if you're a Portuguese national and you're changing your tax jurisdiction to a, a blacklisted territory, there could be complications for a further five years, so just something to, to think about. Do you need a will as a Portuguese tax resident? Well, yes and no. Um, in theory, you don't need a will. So imagine you have a UK will that could cover your worldwide estate, including Portuguese assets. However, in a practical sense, if you think about it logically, you've got a UK will which is written in, Engl in the English language and uh, under common law rules. Uh, Portuguese, the territory of Portuguese is a, is a civil law jurisdiction and obviously any language will be written in Portuguese, so you've got a mismatch there in both language and in law. So we always say to clients, uh, have a will per jurisdiction of assets. So if you have a Portuguese property or any Portuguese assets, have a Portuguese will specifically for those assets and have a UK will covering your UK assets and property. Make things very simple. Uh, it can help your executors and your beneficiaries Connected with the issues of wills is the principle of succession law in civil law countries. So Portugal, unlike other countries in Europe, has a forced heirship regime. So unlike the UK where we have free testamentary disposition, i.e. we can choose whoever we wish to benefit from our uh, estate when we die, in Portugal the, the state can step in and dict dictate who your assets should be distributed to. And this works in a similar way to the law of intestacy in the UK. If you die without a UK will in place, the state would step in and distribute your estate in accordance with the law of intestacy. Um, Portugal uh, operates that method by default. However, there is the opportunity to elect out of that system. So you can bypass these forced airship uh, rules by electing what's called Brussels 4, so Brussels 1V. It's an, an EU directive which allows you to use the law of your nationality in the reading of your will rather than the forced airship rules as dictated by the state. So in other words, as we have free testamentary disposition in the UK, we can continue along that basis even in our Portuguese will. It's important to note that this doesn't affect the tax position in any way, it's more of a legal matter and an estate distribution issue rather than a financial stroke tax issue. So if you want to buy a property in Portugal, what tax rates are you going to face? Well, buying a property here can be quite expensive and there's a number of different taxes that apply. And if you think about notary fees and lawyers fees, people generally say uh, around eight to 10% will cover everything. But if you look at the tax issues in particular, you've got two main ones. The first one is stamp duty, which is a, a flat rate of 0.8%. And the second one is IMT. And the IMT rate uh, varies uh, according to what type of property it is whether it's going to be used as a main home or not, whereabouts it is, um, if it's held within the company structure or not, uh, and also the value. So there's a number of different factors that um, apply, but the, the, the rates start at, looking at the uh, scale, the rates start at zero for very low value properties, all the way up to 7.5%. If we're looking at ongoing tax issues as a property owner in Portugal, the, the key one is, um, IMI, IMI, which is uh, an annual tax that you pay, you, you pay on your property, and that's the equivalent to uh, council tax in the UK. And looking at the rates here, we've got a rate from 0.3% up to 0.8% uh, annually. And that's actually based not necessarily on the market value of the property, but what, what we call the valor patrimonial, which is the registered value 
at the local town hall. There's also an additional EMI tax, so it's AIMI tax. And this is a, a tax that's levied on high value properties. So each person has an allowance of 600,000 euros each. So if you're buying a property as a couple and it's worth 1.2 million euros or more, you're going to face an additional um, council tax effectively. And for that reason, some people are calling this Portuguese wealth tax because it's effectively taxing you on a higher value property. Uh, a bit misleading because it's not really um, taxing on your wealth as such, it's directed specifically towards the value of the property. So I hope you found this video uh, useful. If you, uh, if you did, please like uh, and subscribe to the channel. Also, please feel free to su uh, suggest other topics for future videos because I'm doing these videos to hopefully provide some value to you and uh, help you. So uh, please, please feel free to reach out. Thank you.